Welcome back with today's lecture 13. Uh, the goal today is to kind of gather together everything that we have covered for the test material. Um, I think it was Kelly yesterday made a good suggestion that I uh, locate an appropriate old test that I've given over this section. It may not be exactly the same material, but um, I'll try to do that, and that'll be what we do tomorrow, kind of look at some problems, how they might be asked on the test. Um, sometimes it's appropriate. I know most of you have never had a test from me, but uh, sometimes it's appropriate on a test to say, um, you know, set up this volume uh, problem, do not integrate, and do not evaluate. So that's a way that I could actually ask more questions without having to get to a place where we get to. We, we do that in class sometimes when we get it to a point where it's set up, we've got the limits of integration, we've simplified everything we're going to do. Um, a lot of times we integrate it and don't evaluate it. Sometimes we don't even integrate it and evaluate it. That's a potential test type question also. So that would be primarily um, to save time, get more questions on the test. And you, you may think that, well, I don't want that. I don't want more questions on the test. I, I think that you do. Because if we had five questions and you miss one, they're 20 points each. But you know, if we have seven questions and you miss one, they're 14 points each. So the more questions, the, the less value for each question. So if some, somebody, it probably never happens to you, but you, know, you might forget how to do something. Um, then it's a little more forgiving when there are more questions. So let's, uh, and really web assign questions today. We had some after class yesterday. Uh, any web assign question that you have uh, is fair game today in class. Uh, not probably to the point where we're going to do it all the way through, but we'll at least get it to the point where, you know, it's jump started for you and you can take it from there. Uh, but let's start to kind of gather where this course started and what you should be prepared for for test one. Um, even though 5.7 and 5.8 are technically review, I, I know that we've got people from uh, not only other 141 classes on campus that are coming to this 241 class. Probably a couple of you in here did not take 141 on this campus and you had calculus at a community college or a high school. Um, so it's kind of a starting point. Uh, we obviously expect you to know it, but because it's where we started in 241, we could have questions from 5.7 and 5.8 on this test, and we will. So from 5.7, we had three types of problems. Um, I don't know that today, I don't, I don't, are we going to have web assigned questions today? Anybody? Yes? You have some web assigned questions? You, I mean, you have them with you? And, yeah. Okay. Anybody else have web assigned questions? Okay. All right. So what we may not be able to do at each topic is come up with a kind of a sample problem, but if you have a web assigned question that's related to, let's say, trig integrals, <coughs> Now would be the time for us to do that. Now, for trig integrals, what are we talking about here? We're talking about powers of sines and cosines. So so if you have a sine cubed and a cosine to the fourth in the integrand, okay, we've, we've got to be able to deal with that. Um, also, powers of secant and tangent. We did some problems with secant and tangent. Since this is kind of gather up day and, and um, do those kinds of things, refresh and review, sines and cosines, now if we see them in an integrand, what are the things that you want to think about when you see sines and cosines. How are sines and cosines related to one another in calculus? 
Okay. Derivative of sine is cosine. Derivative of cosine is negative, negative sine. So they're they're kind of derivatives of one another, as long as you correct for a minus sign on one of them. How else are sines and cosines related that might come in handy when you are handed a integrand that has cosine to a power of an angle, sine to a power of the same angle? Okay. Sine squared plus cosine squared is one, <coughs> so you can get a couple of different versions of that. Sine squared is what? One minus cosine squared. Cosine squared is one minus sine squared. What's the bad case here? What's the one that kind of isn't as smooth as the others with powers of sine and cosine? Mm -hmm. Double angle. Uh, the double angle identity, and when do we need to use the double angle identity? Even powers. Even. Even powers of sine and cosine is kind of the stubborn one. So if we have a sine squared, and we're stuck with that, or a sine to the fourth, or even powers of both of them, cosine squared, sine to the fourth, then we're in a position where we need to use the double angle identities. And um, So this kind of arsenal of weapons then allows us to deal with these trig integrals. So I don't know if I mentioned in here that I had an outside possibility of going to the Super Bowl. Uh, that fell through um, over the weekend, last weekend. I kind of thought it was um, kind of lame originally because the tickets are going for like sixteen hundred dollars. You know, I just don't have a spare sixteen hundred dollars to you know <laughs> bolt down to Tampa and see the Super Bowl. So we had a connection on the coaching staff, the receivers coach of the Steelers, uh, a friend of mine who lives in Cary, coached him in high school baseball in Pennsylvania. So that was our connection, but. It, fell apart pretty rapidly. <laughs> but I've never been, and I'd really like to go to a Super Bowl sometime. Um, so if we're stuck with sine squared, or we're stuck with cosine squared, and we have to use that double angle identity, what are those? What's sine squared? One minus cosine. Yeah. Okay, and this is one plus? Yes. And if that kind of is gone from your memory when you need it, you can kind of develop the uh, cosine of two theta as cosine squared minus sine squared, that kind of double angle identity, and come up with both of these if you need to in a matter of a few seconds, I hope. So all that kind of is in the arsenal of weapons to attack this kind of problem. Now, does anybody have a secant tangent type integrand or a sine cosine type integrand on a web assigned question? Okay, how about let's just go ahead and verbalize but not write down how secant and tangent are related in the same kind of line of thinking. If you have a secant squared and a tangent squared of the same angle in the integrand and we have their product, what are some of the same thought process? 1 plus tangent squared equals secant squared. Okay, 1 plus tangent squared is secant squared, which will give you the, what, tangent squared equals secant squared minus 1, right? What else, how else are the tangent and secant related that might come in handy? And it being sine over cosine. Well, we could change them to sines and cosines. That, uh, if something's not coming to mind and you kind of draw a blank on the interrelationship of secant and tangent, change it to sines and cosines and maybe go with this. That's a possibility. Derivative of tangent squared. Derivative of tangent is secant squared. That was kind of stereo. I like that. And yes. derivative of secant is secant tangent. 
So those kinds of interrelationships allow us to simplify the integrand, write it in terms of u to a power du, and then hopefully once we get it to that point, it's fairly easy, easily integrated. So I'll bring in an old test tomorrow, and if I don't have one of these on there, I'll make one up and we'll go through it. What else in 5.7? Trig substitution. And I guess, really, it would probably be fair to say in 5.7 and the appendix in the back of the book that covers um, partial fractions, is that G? Yes. Yes. So appendix G, especially when we get to partial fractions, if there's anything back there that's going to be helpful to you, I guess that's kind of the algebraic breakdown or decomposition into partial fractions. Trig substitution, they do not have trig in them, but they have a variety of radicals. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's one of the types. A is a number. We may not like what A is. A might be the square root of 7, but A squared is okay. That's 7. So don't ever worry about that. That shouldn't be in the way of getting to a solution in a problem. U squared is the variable thing that's being squared. So if it's just x squared, u squared is x squared, then that's fine. Uh, but also it might be 9x squared. So u would be 3x. So that might come into play. We could have number squared minus variable squared under the radical or variable squared minus number squared. Now you're going to be given, just like in the book, the author um, gives values that you're going to substitute for you, and I'm going to provide this on the test. Uh, if it's the sum of things squared, we just had a uh, Pythagorean identity was what? 1 plus tangent squared? is secant squared, right? So if we've got the plus thing going on, we could let u equal a tangent, and that ought to get us somewhere, because eventually we could have a 1 plus tangent squared under the radical. What is 1 plus tangent squared? It's secant squared, so you can simplify that. This will be given to you, so you don't have to come up with that yourself, but what to do from that point on, you need to know. How about the difference here? So if we could come up with a, how about a 1 minus something squared that itself would be a perfect square. What's a candidate there? Sine. Sine? Sine? Yes. Again, that's going to be given to you. So it'll say let u or whatever the variable quantity in the problem is. Um, equal 4 sine theta, or just sine theta, or 9 sine theta, whatever. How about variable quantity squared minus number squared under the radical? What Pythagorean identity has is going to secant squared minus 1, right? So these things will be given but you'll need to be able to take it from there. So one of the key steps, does anybody have a web assigned question with a trig substitution? One of the key steps then is once you are handed what you want u to represent is you need to find what du is based on that, right? So if u, as in this case, is a tangent theta, what's derivative of u? A secant squared theta, d theta, right? Because we're going to change the problem um, to a u, uh, sorry, to a theta, d theta problem. So we're going to have to get d theta in the integrand somehow, and that's how we're going to do it. So where there's a du in the integrand, we will replace it with a secant squared theta, d theta. Same thing here, find du, and same thing here, find du. Questions or issues with trig substitution?
and no web assigned questions, right, that anybody has? The other part of 5.7 is uh, integration by after decomposing into partial fractions. So if you felt comfortable with this stuff at the end of 141 and what we did earlier in this course refreshed you on this stuff, then this is not going to take a lot of your study time to go back and refresh yourself again with partial fractions. And there's really, uh, I, I, technically I guess there's four categories, but really two main categories that if you have, um, let's say, a linear factor and an irreducible quadratic factor, Now, we've got to have the degree of the numerator smaller, so the degree of the denominator is x cubed, right? So if we have something of smaller degree, then we can go right to the partial fractions decomposition. So let's say we have 2x squared minus x plus 7. So we've been handed an integral problem. So this in kind of product and or quotient form, we don't like it if we can decompose it into pieces. Uh, that are added together, we can integrate each part of the sum. So here's one of our rules. I, let me backtrack because I'm afraid I'm going to forget this. I've already forgotten it once today, just like 30 seconds ago. If the degree of the numerator is larger than the denominator, what is the first step before you decompose? Long division. Long division, or if it's equal, right? If this is x cubed and this is x cubed, do the long division first, but as long as it's smaller than the degree of the denominator, then you're, you're okay to just to start this process. So we have a linear factor. What kind of numerator will a linear factor get no matter how many times that factor is itself used as a factor? Constant. So even if we had an x plus 2 to the third, wouldn't each time we use that Right? Get a linear factor. Get a, uh, for the linear factor in the denominator, gets a constant numerator. Linear factors, constant numerator. Here's an irreducible quadratic. And if it's reducible, then reduce it, and you don't have to use this. So if it's x squared minus 9, break that up into x minus 3, x plus 3. Why? Well, because when you're done, you've got a number over x plus 3, that's a pretty quick integral problem, isn't it? Natural log. Or you've got a number over the other one, x minus 3, another natural log. So the more you can break it down ahead of time, the easier it's going to be once it's broken down. Can't reduce or simplify x squared plus 9. What kind of numerator does it get? Okay, linear. So <laughs> some kind of new letter other than A, it might be the same letter, but we have to allow for the fact that it's different. And then we would, what, from this point? Get a common denominator, equate coefficients of x squared on the left side of the equal sign to coefficients of x squared on the right side of the equal sign, and go from there. Um, I'm, yeah, question? Do you have one of those, yeah, Nicole? I, have a, I don't know if it's done the same way, because I have no idea how to start it, but... Um, it was x squared over x minus 3 times x plus 2 squared. x plus 2, the quantity squared? Right. Okay, let's look at that one, because that's got the other thing that uh, this problem didn't have. So you're integrating. x squared is the numerator. Yep. What's the rest of it, please? Um, x minus 3 times x plus 2 squared. And it's an indefinite integral? Yes. Okay. And that's a web assigned question? Do you have what section or whatever that is? Okay. And the problems might differ a little bit. Um, they have, that's what? That's number seven in On. Appendix G. Okay. Appendix G. Number seven. Thank you. So we don't want to do the, in, well, first things first. Can we go right to the decomposition? No. What's the degree of the numerator? X squared. What's the degree of the denominator? 
x cubed, right? Here's an x, and this x is squared. So we've got an x squared times an x. So we've got x squared over x cubed. We can go right to the algebra piece where we're going to try to break this down. Okay, tell me what to write down. Look, slightly different, but has some of the features of the problem, kind of generic problem we just looked at. A over x minus 3. Good. B over x plus 2 squared. And C over x plus 2. Good. Everybody all right with that? All linear factors. Even though this is a repeated linear factor, it still gets a constant numerator. Why do you have to have the x plus 2 on the end? Um, let me try to answer that question with uh, an algebra. I'm going to reverse your question. If you had this problem right here mm -hmm. in an Algebra 2 class in high school at Middle Creek High School, the Mustangs, okay, which is where she went to high school, um, you would say, okay, I'm going to add these fractions. What is the common denominator? Kind of what's the least common multiple of these three denominators? And what, what would you want to have when you added these fractions together? You want to get a common denominator of what? Don't you need an x minus 3, right? Because it's in this denominator. And you certainly need an x plus 2. But that's not quite enough because that wouldn't accommodate this denominator. So you're going to need an x plus 2 squared. Is that right? So if you were doing an Algebra 2 problem and that problem is to put these three things together, you would then multiply this one by x plus 2 squared over x plus 2 squared, this one by x minus 3 over x minus 3, and this one by what? x minus 3, x plus 2, x minus 3, x plus 2. So the you're kind of reversing that thought, and you're saying, if I have something that has that already in its denominator, is there a chance that there could be a term like this? Yeah, there's a chance that, so we have to allow for it. So if it was x plus 2 cubed, we'd have another do, one. You would have x plus 2 squared and then x plus 2. You'd have x plus 2, you have a constant over x plus mm -hmm. 2, constant over x plus 2, the quantity squared, okay. and another constant over x plus 2, okay. the quantity cubed. So for repeated linear factors, you allow for that to the first, to the second, to the third, or to whatever degree it's repeated. I don't, I don't know if that answered your question, but it's, it's the what your thought process was in algebra, you're now kind of allowing for the possibility of that kind of term being present. Everybody okay with that? Get a common denominator, equate the numerators. I, well, let's go a little further, since that's a web assigned question. We need a x plus 2 squared here and here. We need an x minus 3 here and here. And we need an x plus 2, because we only had one of them. And we need it squared. And an x minus 3. Now, I know a lot of you consolidate steps, and that's fine to do on the test on Friday. Uh, don't consolidate steps to the point where you're making too big of a leap and you're going to make sine errors and coefficient errors and squaring and cubing errors. But you don't have to show every step necessarily that we're showing right here. Um, I don't know. See if we can do this part in our head. How many x squared are we going to have in all these numerators? Right, we're going to have an ax squared here. When this gets expanded, an a gets distributed. No x squareds here. Here we're going to have an x squared, and then that's going to be multiplied by c. So we're going to have a plus c. Is that good? So what's a plus c equal to? One, one right, because we've got one over here. And if they're equal, denominators are equal, so therefore the num numerators have to be equal. 1x squared better be equal to a plus cx squared. All right, how many x do we have? Well, middle term here is going to be 
X, so there's going to be a 4A, is that right? There's a B here, and the middle term here is what? Minus 1, right? So minus C, does that work? And then everything else that doesn't have an X squared or doesn't have an X is a constant. So we're going to have 4A, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And what, 9, I'm sorry, negative 3B? And negative 6C? So A plus C better be 1. 4A plus B minus C, equal zero. right, equals 0, because we don't have any X over here. I guess technically we have 0X. And then 4A minus 3B minus 6C is also 0. What method would you want to use to solve this from here? Set the two at the bottom equal to each other. Okay. And what are we going to accomplish by that? You get rid of a couple things, and it's easier with A and C. You can knock out the Just four A's. Two A's. Okay, we can knock out the four A's that yeah. way, right? So we'd have B's and C's. Mm -hmm. And you um, solve for C. And, and you could the then thing. take, then you'd have one equation that had B's and C's in it. So what would you want to do with that? Right, if you so equated, these are both equal to zero. So the suggestion is that we set them equal to each other. Strike the 4A and 4A on both sides, and you'd have one equation, right, with B's and C's in it. What are we going to do with that one equation with B's and C's in it? Stop. Uh, 9C in the first equation, and then put... I mean, I'm not opposed to it, but I, I want to know what we're going to do with it when we when we get to that point. I mean, I like the four A's are gone. Solve for C, yeah. and then plug it into another equation, and then solve for another. Solve. solve for C. Yeah. All right. So if we did this, here, here's where we would be. So those are gone. So we have one equation with two variables in it. So let's say we put it all on the same side. So we add 3B, so there's 4B. And we add 6C, which would be 5C. Is that right? Now where do we go? Solve for B. I mean, solve for C. Okay. No, no, solve for B. Solve for B. Solve for B. Yeah. So B equals negative 5C divided by 4. Does that work? Mm -hmm. And then solve for C in the first one. Okay. C equals. What am I saying? And then put all that in the second one and change the C to an A. Here? Yeah. So you want to use this in here? Mm-hmm. Okay. We're kind of working our way around the corner here. So if C is 1 minus A, can I recommend a different path? Yes. Okay. Go for it. Um, If we say, I like this, and you can either solve for A or for C, and if we substitute, let's say C equals 1 minus A, if we plug that in here, and we plug that in here, don't we still have two equations, right? Now, what about those two equations? Aren't we rid of C? And we have two equations with two variables? Right. And then we can kind of mess <laughs> with them and get rid of the other variable. 
So the problem, I think, with something like this is, as tempting as that is, that was actually my first thought, too, is I like the 4a. They're both equal to 0. Let's set them equal to each other. 4a's are gone. Now we have one equation, but we have two letters in that equation. So why don't we use this substitution to help this equation to reduce it from three letters to two, and this equation from three letters to two, and see what we come up with that way. So the second equation, 4a plus b minus c, well, what is c equal to? 1 minus a. That's 0. This equation, 4a minus 3b minus 6c would be minus 6 times c is now 1 minus a. Now, we lose the luxury of having 4a and 4a, but at least now we have two equations with two variables. So the first equation is what? 5a? Because we've got minus a minus a. 5a plus b equals 0. And what's this second equation? 10a minus 3b minus 6. There's a minus Is one. Is that a yeah. one? Top one. 5A plus B. Oh, we've got a minus one. Yes, right there. Minus one. Thank you. And here we've got 10A minus 3B minus, 3B minus 6. Minus six. <coughs> so let me rewrite them. Now we've got two equations and two variables. So what would be the plan anytime you have two equations and two variables? Solve one for one variable, then plug it in. Okay, you could solve one, let's say the top one for B, plug that into the other one, right? Or we'll solve the top one. Right. Line, some type of linear combination where you multiply one equation by a constant, add the two equations together. Multiply the top by three. Top by three. Three? Okay, that'll work. So 15a plus 3b minus 3. Second equation, leave it alone. And add, right? 25a, those are gone. Minus 9. So a, boy, that's a nice number. 9 over 25. Does it really matter that A is an ugly number? Is it going to make the integration that much worse? No. I mean, here's, here's the, the decomposed piece that has A in it. If A is 9 25ths, is that going to, you know, radically disturb our world this morning? It's a natural log, isn't it? Bring the 9 25ths out in front. Question. First, do the fraction thing where you put like A over something and plus B over. Do you have to do X plus Q squared mm -hmm. for B or can that go under C? Uh, let's, let's say that when you broke this down, you had B over X plus 2 yes. and C over X plus 2, the quantity squared, and we did it this way. Your answer for your B would be our C and vice versa. So we'll Right. Do that. Yes. Yeah. Still going to be a number, and you're still going to be integrating that term. Your your b and c would just be the reverse of our b and c. All right. So we can get to what we need to get to today. <coughs> now that we know a, how do we find b? You have to find c first. C sixteen twenty fifth. Okay. Well, we do know a nice clean interrelationship of a and c right there. Right? Mm -hmm. So if we know A, C is just 1 minus A, which is 1 minus 9 25ths. So C is 16 25ths, another delightful number. And if we know A and C, then we can plug back into an appropriate equation, not the first one, because it doesn't have any B's in it, but any of the equations, and we can solve for B. B is going to be a number, right? So let's look at our original decomposition.
there's our original decomposition. A is a number, so when we integrate, what was it, 9 25ths over x minus 3, what's the answer? And if you have to think about this more than 15 seconds, you really need to do some digging in before Friday. There we go. 9 25ths, natural log of the absolute value of x minus 3, right? That's a du over u with a little extra baggage. All right, C, isn't that the same kind of animal? Do we have C? What was it? 16 25ths. What's the answer to this? 16 25ths, natural log, absolute value of x plus 2. There we go. 16 25ths, natural log, absolute value of x plus 2. Now, this isn't going to be a natural log. Not going to be an inverse tangent. But we do, we need to talk about what constitutes an inverse tangent before we leave this section. You would say u is equal to x plus 2 then you're going to have a u squared, or a u to the negative second, right? Did anybody run through and get a value for b? What was it? Uh, negative 20 over 25. Ooh, great. I like that. I'm sorry that we missed that, doing that together. What is it? Negative? Negative 20 over 25. I'll go right back to my office and do that when we're done. So here's our middle one. So whether you actually write this down or you think about it, we're going to let u equal x plus 2. Is everybody convinced Can that this is not a natural law? Yeah. What, what has to be the case for it to be a natural law? X to the first, to the first in the denominator, right? Or u to the first or r to the first. Here we've got it to the second, so that throws that out. Can and we don't need that special case because this is just a power rule, right? Can you pull out the negative 20 over 25? Yes, yeah, and I, I think that would be wise to do that. <coughs> just, especially if it's ugly like this, just get it out of the way. That's what my wife says to me. You're just, you know, you're ugly. Would you sit in the other room, please? Would you go out there where I can't see you anymore? <laughs> Not really. She's a lot nicer than that. <laughs> <laughs> I do get to come in the house. So if u is equal to x plus 2, du is dx. 1 dx. So this problem really becomes dx is really du. And this x plus 2, the quantity squared, is really now u squared. So I think that's kind of a goal. Uh, I think I said that earlier in this class, um, that the goal is for you to kind of think through this stuff now that you've seen it several times at the end of Calc 1 and now the beginning of Calc 2, um, <coughs> that you recognize, first of all, it's not a natural log. That's u to the negative second. And what's the integral of u to the negative second? Negative 1 over u. Negative 1 over u, right? u to the power rule, one degree larger over that new exponent, right? And then you'd sub back in what u. So the first one, our first one and our last one were natural logs. This one in the middle with the denominator x plus 2, the quantity squared, uses the power rule. So u was representing x plus 2 temporarily, so we plugged that back in. Is that okay? How many of you are doing most of this right here in your head? Okay. I, can, I mean, I can see several of you. I, I wasn't a shock to me, those that raised their hands, because I can see your engines working. And you're, you know, you're way ahead of where I am writing things down. But that would be a nice goal, is to do more and more of that in your head. And then the stuff that does require us to write down more steps, we can write down more steps. Uh, inverse tangent came up. So let's, before we leave partial fractions, does that, does that work for that problem? I mean, at least we got it integrated, right, we think? Um, if you have, 
And I had a problem up here a minute ago that, um, see if I can write it down again. I had x squared plus 9, right? And an x plus 2. And I'm just going to kind of do this in the numerator, okay? We have a term up here that is less than third degree. I think I had a 2x squared. I, I made it up, so I know it's not going to work out very nicely. And we just had one that had some ugly coefficients. But let's say we take this and we decompose it, and we get 3 over x plus 2. And here is our irreducible quadratic denominator. And we allow for a linear numerator, some bx plus c. We have b is negative 5, and c is 1. So I'm getting to the inverse tangent thing, but I'm trying to relate it to partial fractions. So this is our original problem. We did the decomposition. All right, first one, we just did that stuff. That is going to be 3 natural log absolute value x plus 2. What are we going to do with this one? Okay, not yet. Eventually, yes. Substitution at the bottom. Split it up. Split it up. Okay, yeah. we've got negative 5x over this. Now, it also, I think, be a wonderful um, cogn cognitive experience that if we know why we're doing that. Why would this problem, why is it to our advantage to break it up into two pieces? Okay, there's one of them. To have a number, it doesn't matter really that it's one, but some number. If it's not one, you just bring it out in front. This is an inverse tangent integrand, right? Because the derivative of inverse tangent is 1 over 1 plus x squared. We don't have exactly that, but we have an, another version of it. This is not an inverse tangent. But this also works out nicely to have the x term in the numerator and the x squared term in the denominator. What is this guy? With, and what's, what's the result going to be? If u is x squared plus 9, don't we have kind of du in the numerator, correctable version of du? What's du over u? Natural log. This is a natural log. So if the bottom is x squared and the top is x, that's a very strong candidate for natural log. And in fact, this one's going to be a natural log. Sometimes I can read your faces, and I know it's time to move on to the next problem. I didn't see that look on this problem. So let's take both of these pieces and finish them. Uh, so here, that's not good. <coughs> so if u is that quantity in the bottom, x squared plus 9, what's derivative of u? 2x dx. Okay, negative 5 is in the way. Let's move it out front. So that's gone. What do we need in the integrand? We need a 2. I can't just manufacture a 2, so I have to yeah. divide by 2 also. So now what's the numerator? D. That's du. <coughs> and what's the denominator? Yeah. U. So we've got du over u. And the integral of du over u, as we said just a minute and a half ago, is natural log. So we've got negative 5 halves, natural log. And you can use absolute value, 
but you really don't need it here. <coughs> All right, with that one? Now, generically, and when we covered this, we actually derived this in class. And when we covered it, I said it's probably a good thing to kind of just commit to memory because we're going to see it a lot, and we have seen it a lot so far. So I think it's probably valid to say that when we see something in this form where this is variable squared plus number squared, one or some other number that you can farm out front, that integrates to 1 over A. 1 over A. Tangent inverse. U over A. U over A plus C, right? So if you have that committed to memory, then you don't have to do the battle each time with this. Hopefully you recognize that as kind of looking like the derivative of an inverse tangent. But this lead coefficient in the U over A, now that we've kind of done the battle and seen that that's the case all the time, makes this a little quicker, so the answer would be 1 over 3 of x over 3 plus c. Let's move on to a tougher problem, one that's actually going to challenge us a little bit, right? So that all falls under the category kind of of um, decomposition into partial fractions. All right, uh, real quickly. 5.8. I realize we got kind of bogged down there, but I still think that's time well spent because I can tell by facial expressions that that wasn't where it needs to be um, by Friday. Uh, using the table of integrals, and if you have a 5.8 web assigned question, we can start class with that tomorrow. Table of integrals, remember, is, I mean, you think this is the easiest thing we've ever done in any math class. And it can be, but remember, you've got to take what you're given and you've got to make it match exactly. So if it doesn't match exactly, I remember a problem we did in class that had an x squared here and a 4x squared, I think, minus 7 there. Well, if that's what we're going to let be u squared, then that can't be u squared also, right? When you look in the table of integrals, you're going to see something that looks like this. But if we have it exactly, and we want to use this formula from the table of integrals, what we're calling u squared better be here exactly. And if it's not, we need to kind of doctor it up so that it is. And you can doctor up numerical stuff. You can't doctor up variable quantities. So what could we do if we want to call that u squared, what could we do to this? Multiply by 4 in the denominator. What would compensate for multiplication by 4 in the denominator? Multiply by 4 in the numerator, but I don't really want it in the numerator. I just want to take it and move it outside. So that becomes a u squared, just exactly like that's a u squared. So we do have to make our problem match what we see in the table of integrals. And once we do that, then we don't have to integrate it. It's already been done for us. But if somebody has a table of integrals problem, we can start class with that tomorrow. I'll bring an old test tomorrow and either hand you out a copy of it or at least do enough of it up here that you basically have it. And any web assigned questions that you want to ask tomorrow, those are fair game too.